Thin Air is an independently produced podcast by Daniel Calderon and Jordan Sims. To help support Thin Air Podcast, head over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash thinairpodcast. There, you can donate any amount monthly to supporting this podcast. In exchange for a monthly contribution, you will receive rewards. For example, if you contribute $5 a month, you will receive access to ad-free episodes, mini-episodes, and full PDF transcripts of our shows. Your patronage goes to helping cover the cost of research, production, and publishing. To everyone who has already contributed, thank you. And to all our future donors, thank you too. Today's episode of Thin Air is brought to you by Wink. Wink is the market-leading, direct-to-consumer wine company, offering a wine club for a new generation of wine drinkers. Wink is offering our audience members who are 21 and live in the U.S. a $22 credit plus free shipping on their first order of four bottles of wine as a new member of Wink. So to try it out for yourself and to save $22, go to trywink.com slash thinair. Remember, go to trywink.com slash thin air and get $22 off when you become a new member. On the morning of September 14th, 2007, 14-year-old Andrew Gosden woke up and got dressed as usual for another Friday at McAuley Catholic High School in Doncaster, a city roughly 177 miles north of London, England. The last time I ever saw him, he was just going out the front door with his school uniform on, and he said, bye, Dad, see you later. And I said, yep, see you later. It seemed perfectly normal. My name is Kevin Gosden. Um, Andrew Gosden is my son, or was my son. Kevin had no reason to be suspicious. Andrew was bright and had a perfect attendance record at school. He came from a small, close-knit family that consisted of himself, his sister Charlotte, and his two parents, Kevin and Glennis. On a typical day, Andrew would leave early in the morning to catch the local school bus, which would take him the short three to four mile journey from his house to his school. But this wasn't a typical day for Andrew, and the decisions he made that morning still baffle his father today. I still have no idea what Andrew was thinking, what on earth got into his head, what he thought he was doing that day. But I know that he could not have come from a more secure background. He could not have grown up in our house and not thought he was loved and respected and cared about. Instead of boarding the school bus that morning, Andrew walked to a nearby park and waited for his parents to leave for work. We found out subsequently a neighbor of ours happens happens to have a closed circuit television at the front of his house. We found out that what had happened was that Andrew had waited for my wife and I to then leave the house, which was just a few minutes after he left. He'd gone over the road where there's a local open area park. Seen our car go past. And then he came back, let himself into the house, changed out of his school uniform, put casual clothes on, and then left the house. He actually took the care to do the sort of normal daily thing of putting his shirt and trousers into the washing machine ready for the wash and he hung up his blazer and tie on the back of the chair in his bedroom quite tidily but which seems like a very everyday thing to do so i think he changed into some black jeans and a, i think it was a slipknot t-shirt he went to a cash machine and withdrew basically all his money, which was £200. The £200 in Andrew's account was money he had been saving up, mostly as gifts from his birthday a few months earlier. 
With the money in hand, he walked into the Doncaster railway station and purchased a one-way ticket to London, leaving at 9.35 a.m. It wasn't long after school started that Andrew's absence was noticed. A staff member left a message for someone they believed was Andrew's parents. Unfortunately, what had happened was the school obviously had picked up on it in the morning and they believed they'd placed a call to us in the morning. But unfortunately, they'd read off the telephone number either above or below our entries in in the registration document. And unfortunately, it's just one of those things um, where they happen to call the wrong person. Meanwhile, witnesses on the train to London report that Andrew sat alone and played quietly on his PSP, a portable gaming device, during the two-hour journey to King's Cross Station. At 11.25 a.m., CCTV captures Andrew leaving King's Cross through the sliding glass door at the entrance. These images of a young 14-year-old boy walking out of the station alone and into the largest metropolitan city in England is the last confirmed sighting of Andrew Gosden. I'm Daniel, and this is episode 29 of Thin Air, a podcast dedicated to telling the stories of missing people from all around the world. This episode marks the 10-year anniversary of Andrew's disappearance, which is only a few days after the release of this episode. We hope that by collaborating with his father, Kevin, his sister, Charlotte, and the organization Missing People, we can help raise awareness and possibly provide some long-awaited answers to his family. We later all got home and we were all busy doing our various things after a a normal day at work and we had a a friend had come to eat with us and when it came to meal time we called for Andrew assuming that he was either upstairs in his bedroom and and had been the whole time um, or downstairs we have a a converted basement cellar playing his Xbox and when he wasn't in either of those places we obviously looked all around the house couldn't find him so we thought well you know might he be with a friend or a neighbor and have lost track of the time so obviously we phoned the obvious people and nobody had seen him probably about seven o'clock in the evening, I guess, when we started to think something is really wrong here. At this point, unaware that Andrew has traveled to London alone, Kevin calls the police. So when we got that far, fundamentally, we called the police um, and a a local um, uniformed officer responded very quickly and was quite immediately concerned about how it had panned out. Certainly, I know that his details were circulated within our police force so that the South Yorkshire police force were fairly immediately aware, I think. I I do remember my daughter and I going out and searching along the route that he would take to and from school and any possible areas nearby. Initially, we went through all of the places that were his favourite. We did think London was quite likely, given that we have family there and we've been there many times. I'm Charlotte Ditch, he is my brother. We also thought Whitby was an option because um, that was one of our favourite places to go in the summertime. So we actually went and searched there and then then we found out pretty quickly that he'd got the train to London and um, switched our focus to there. It's relatively soon after Andrew's disappearance that the Gosdens learn that he purchased a one-way ticket to London from the local train station. The transaction was memorable to the teller because of Andrew's rejection of her offer to buy a return ticket for only around a pound more. He did buy the single ticket, but you see, I mean, this does not and never has seemed as odd to me or to our family 
as it might coming at it from the outside. Because a lot of my friends and family live in London, uh, and obviously, therefore, as Andrew was growing up, um, we'd visited many, many times over the years. So he was very familiar with the layout of London and how to navigate his way around the tubes and the buses and so on and so forth. Some of people's initial reactions were like, well, won't that be a bit overwhelming? But, I mean, actually, our first guess was if Andrew has gone anywhere, it would probably be to London. That was our first guess because we knew how much he loved it. Um, and it, it, it turned out that guess was the correct one. To be honest, I think, I mean, all of us, our gut reaction was he's gone to do something or to see something that we didn't give permission for because it involved a school day. <laughs> and he just figured, it's okay, I'll end up at my uncle's or my grandparents or any number of people and then I'll face the music later, you know? <laughs> or at least from arm's length. Um, it's not so odd that he didn't actually get a return ticket. He, you know, he may well have thought, well, it just really doesn't make any difference because, you know, I'm planning to end up at my, my granddad's or something. Can you describe what he takes with him that day after he leaves? As far as we could discover, he took with him his favourite bag, which was a black canvas bag that his sister had stitched a lot of patches for metal and rock bands on that he liked. He took his portable PlayStation, but not the charger which I always think is an, an odd thing if you were planning to stay away for any time. He took his wallet and keys, and other than that, we were not able to identify anything else he had taken. And none of those items have ever been found or located? No, no. But he, I mean, he appeared not to even take a sweatshirt or something in case it was cold. One of the first things his family did upon hearing the news that he had traveled to London was to try to piece together the reasons why he would make the almost two-hour journey south. One of the first things we did was buy a Time Out magazine and go through all the ads, and we personally visited every venue that we could think of with anything remotely uh, attractive to him. Also, uh, we checked... He was very bright and you know, had a lot of interest in a number of subjects. And we, we checked events at museums and exhibitions and so forth. We made lists of absolutely everywhere that we could ever remember him going in London that he had liked and therefore may want to revisit. My wife, my daughter and myself were up and down to London constantly in the first few weeks, leafleting asking at any venue we could think of if they'd seen anyone, would they display a poster in case uh, a customer or a visitor might have seen something. You know, we just went through absolutely every possibility we could think of. I think at the very beginning, I was very hopeful that he would have gone off to do something and just not wanted to tell us and, you know, he would come back pretty quickly. After the first few days, it really sank in that this wasn't a temporary thing and I had a bit of a breakdown. I'm never going to see my brother again, you know. I think it, after a few days it kicks in that, you know, he'd lost. It's not a temporary thing. I think at first there was always that hope that he'd gone away for a specific reason and was just going to come back. But once we realised that wasn't the case, I think it became a lot more scary. With no word from Andrew, the Gosdens looked back on the time before his disappearance for any warning signs that he may have been bullied, depressed, or was planning to run away. What happened at home the night before his disappearance? Nothing, really. 
that's the, I mean, this, but I mean, this is the really strange thing. You know, you, you obviously question yourself. Well, did he ever seem upset or low in mood and, and we didn't notice? He seemed perfectly okay. We did our usual thing. We ate a meal together as we practically always did. We did the dishes together. Then he watched some comedy on, on the television later on and went up to bed. Yeah, no, it was just a, a very, very sort of average evening. Did Andrew have any, or did you notice if Andrew had any problems with depression at all or, or being sad or melancholy? No, no. Um, that, again, that's one of the things you look back on and you think, you know, did we not spot something? Were we too busy with work and everything to not notice? And, and honestly, none of us can look back and, uh, you know, and, and see any of the normal signs. I mean, if, if he proves anything, it is that you can have a secure, comfortable home, family, school, church life, but something, goodness knows what, but something can still go in your head to make you think, I don't know, that or to take you into danger, or just to think, well, the grass might be greener on the other side. But, I mean, that's guesswork. You know, as to what on earth made him disappear that day. Charlotte also didn't notice any change in her brother's demeanor. He was very quiet, so he was the kind of person where, I guess, he kind of kept himself to himself a lot of the time which I think is quite normal for a lot of teenage boys, to be fair. So I don't think it was anything unusual, but he he wasn't massively open, whereas I was quite a noisy person, still am to this day. Um, so I think, you know, if I was annoyed or upset about anything, people would know about it. <laughs> but um, he wasn't like that. I think he internalised things more. So, yeah, we we just had no idea there was anything wrong, if there was anything wrong. Both Charlotte and her father speculated that, if anything, Andrew's reclusiveness was most likely a side effect of being intellectually gifted, which set him apart from most of his peers. He was very exceptionally clever. I think everything just came naturally to him. He could learn anything very, very quickly. He was sharp. I'm quite bright and I I was good at at maths and things like that, but he was like just genius level. (laughs) He could just do anything in his head very quickly. He was just gifted. And that's one of the things that went through my mind was that he was not liking the idea of having to stay at school for another couple of years. And I think he maybe wanted to get away from that. I'm not sure. Did he like going to school or was he, was that something that he enjoyed doing? He never expressed any dislike of it. I can tell you. I I mean, I guess in common with any kid, he enjoyed some subjects more than others. Sometimes he found it was a little easy for him. He was extremely gifted intellectually, way cleverer than I am. Um, (laughs) Not quite sure how he managed that, but very, very good, uh, particularly with maths and so on. Um, The things that he could calculate in his head I mean, I would just be reaching for a pen and paper or a calculator. You know, that can be the downside of of being quite academically gifted, is that, you know, sometimes I guess you need something that triggers you off a, a little bit or gives you a little bit more stimulus than perhaps the national curriculum provides. Even though Andrew may have been perceived as one of the nerds, there were never any signs that he encountered any kind of issues at school, let alone anything that would be considered bullying. 
I have no doubt that he would have been thought of as one of the geeks. <laughs> he would have had no doubt about that, and he would have laughed about it. He would have made jokes about it. For bullying, I would really tend to think that he wasn't bullied. For the following reason, his sister Charlotte is two years older than Andrew. When she was at school, obviously she was at the same school, she was very much a major part of setting up and running or helping to run a school anti-bullying scheme. So bullying is something that we had conversations about around the dinner table, night in, night out. I also think that if Andrew was worried about something and he didn't want to speak to us, I think he would have spoken to Charlotte. They were very close. I think Charlotte lost a best friend as much as she lost a brother when he went missing. From the conversations that we'd had around the dinner table on that sort of topic, he would have known beyond doubt that if he was being bullied or he was scared about something or worried about something, he could have spoken to her and she would have said nothing to a living soul without his permission to do so. You know, I think if there was anybody in the world that he would have confided any issues in, it was his sister and he didn't. Despite not knowing the reasons why Andrew left home that Friday, the Gosdens hoped that the police assigned to the case were doing all they could to pursue any leads or sightings that were being reported. There were two or three very early possible sightings. I mean, you know, within the first week. That really sounded very credible, in part because of the sorts of things that the witnesses said about the way Andrew spoke with them, none of which frustratingly ever seemed to get proven in the sense that CCTV wasn't working or it wasn't gathered. Really, really frustrating. Or by the time the police interviewed the potential witness, it was like six weeks ago. You can kind of move a long way in six weeks, can't you? <laughs> Since then, we've had a number of possible sightings from all over the country and indeed the world at various times, but not a single one of them have we ever been able to demonstrate that it is or was Andrew. Can you sort of speak to the initial investigation? Uh, this is a tough one, because obviously there's lots of strands to it. Broadly speaking, all the uniformed officers that we encountered were really helpful. I mean, I guess you have to have this all over the world. In, in the UK, I think it's 42 or something, or thereabouts, 42 police forces. Plus, you have things in London like the British Transport Police, the National Parks Police, and so on and so forth. I think, you know, each force tends to focus on its own area and are not perhaps good at getting on the phone or the email or whatever, When even when they know that another force, or force is plural in the case of London, really need to be involved and involved very quickly. And unfortunately, that really didn't happen for us. The police locally knew that Andrew, from witnesses who sat opposite him on the train, and the lady who sold him the train ticket, from a number of witnesses, they knew that he had travelled to King's Cross on a specific train. They knew what platform the train arrived on at precisely what time, and yet it took them 27 days to retrieve footage of him leaving the platform and station. Which kind of seems counter to this idea that, like, the whole point of CCTV is to 
protect and be able to get access things quickly. Exactly. And King's Cross Station is like a lot of major stations around the world. It's not the destination. It's an interchange, fundamentally. They never... Nobody ever even asked, for example, the CCTV footage from the underground stations or the entrances there or the platforms there or the trains that left there at the right sort of time, uh, nor for the ones on the bus network, nor, to, to my knowledge, was it ever requested from St Pancras station, which, if you've not been to London, is about 50 meters from King's Cross Station. And for all we know, Andrew could have been on a train to Paris within the hour. I mean, is that something he could have done without needing a passport or without going through some kind of uh, place where they would, you know, have taken record of it or documented it somehow? Well, technically, yes. And he did not take his passport. It was one of the first things we checked. But, um, I mean, this... I and mean, basically, the only clue we had that could have been concrete was to follow the CCTV trail, and it wasn't followed. There seem to have been many problems in the early investigation, including delayed interviews with key witnesses, lackadaisical attempts to retrieve relevant CCTV footage, and inconsistent communication between police departments in different counties. Then, the investigation itself took a bizarre twist as police began to focus on the Gosdens themselves. Basically, they seemed to suddenly turn their focus from... They didn't seem that interested in where has he gone and how do we find him, rather in why did he go missing. Well, that was the one thing that we didn't know, we still don't know, nobody knows. (laughs) But, of course... If you're a policeman, you assume, you, you, you do what I call policing by assumption, and you assume that he must have been abused in some way. For me, this is really difficult because basically there followed a number of veiled and, frankly, unveiled and shocking to me interviews which I was not entitled to any legal representation whereby I was accused of physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional neglect and so on. If they didn't have CCTV of him walking out of King's Cross Station they would have accused me of murder. And and this was... And the whole time I just wanted to go, if you... If you find him, if we find him, you can turn and ask him. And I know what he's going to tell you, which is there is nothing to tell you. These accusations were never found to be true, and Kevin and his wife have never been charged with any crime in relation to Andrew's disappearance. Police have to investigate all possibilities, of course, including foul play, But these baseless suspicions derailed the investigation and the search for Andrew. They also pushed Kevin to the breaking point. It seemed to me that they were wasting a huge amount of time on pursuing the impossible, which is information that I couldn't give them in a million years, rather than spending time coordinating some proper searching and it came to a head for me one day and basically um, I attempted suicide because my logic walked as it possibly is was that if I was out of the way they could not waste their time with this the only thing they would have left to do would be to go look which would be better for Andrew, for my wife and daughter, and so on. So I 
tried to take my own life. I very, very nearly succeeded. This is the miraculous part. I've been a Christian for many, many years. And by chance, I hung myself just as my friend, who was vicar at the time, uh, came to the front door and he heard the crash as I hung myself. But basically, he ran back for a spare key and cut me down. And if he hadn't done so, if he hadn't turned up at that precise moment, if it had been three minutes later, I wouldn't be speaking with you now. But fundamentally, I spent the next uh, four months in acute psychiatric hospital, and I still struggle now daily with post-traumatic stress and depression and anxiety and so on as a result. I have never been able to find the adjectives to describe just how awful this has been. After the break, we return to the story of the disappearance of Andrew Gosden, tackling some of the most popular theories. We also speak to Josie Allen from the organization Missing People in the UK. Thanks to Wink for supporting our podcast. Wink is targeting a new generation of wine drinkers who want to do away with the pretense and simply enjoy reasonably priced, great wine. Wink custom tailors wines to the taste of each individual consumer and delivers three bottles of wine each month to your doorstep for $39 plus a flat $6 shipping rate. Once you visit Wink's website, you can take a 20-second palette profile quiz to get instant wine recommendations based on your unique profile. Right now, Wink is offering our audience members who are 21 and over and live in the U.S. a $22 credit plus free shipping on your first order of four bottles of wine as a new member of Wink. So to try it for yourself, go to trywink.com slash thinair. Trywink is spelled T-R-Y-W-I-N-C dot com slash thinair. And you'll get $22 off your first order of four bottles of wine when you sign up to become a new member. So again, thank you so much to Wink for supporting our podcast, and we would love it if you tried it out for yourself. As the 10-year anniversary of the disappearance of Andrew Gosden approaches, Kevin has been working closely with the UK organization Missing People, to help raise awareness and to let other families who may be going through a similar situation know that there are resources available to them. The UK charity for um, missing people is called Missing People. This year, they have a fundraising campaign called Find Every Child, and Andrew is the poster boy and is currently visible on bus shelters and railway stations and goodness knows what all over the UK as part of that fundraising campaign. I'm Josie Allen, Policy and Campaigns Manager at the charity Missing People. We are a charity that provides support to people that are missing, that's both adults and children. We provide support to people who are thinking about running away and we also support families. We have a 24-hour confidential free helpline and that is a place for people to call and talk through what's going on in their lives, basically. And they're very much trying to raise funds to invest much, much more in helping kids who have run away and subsequently been found or returned to be able to have the resources to find out what they're struggling with, what made them go missing, what made themselves put them at risk, and try and get some support and resources in place so 
so that they're not placing themselves in those situations again. Because I think almost half of uh, teenagers, certainly, who go missing are abused, usually physically, sometimes sexually, you know, and that's plus another high percentage um, will find themselves homeless, cold, hungry, lonely, and so on. In addition, the Missing People Organization also provides support to families who are experiencing something known as ambiguous loss. The term itself was coined in the 1970s by a woman named Pauline Boss. Boss researched and studied the families of soldiers who went missing in action and, without a body, were subsequently never able to break out of the grieving cycle. Sometimes there aren't answers when someone's missing, even for a long time. And it's really, really difficult to live with not knowing what's happening, always hoping that you will see them the next day and the next day. And families tell us how difficult that is. In some ways it's similar to bereavement, but when you add in just the not knowing of what's happened, it can make it even more difficult. The fact is with missing, you just don't know what's happened. So you can't tell someone to believe one thing or another. You just have to support them and make sure that they're not alone and try and ensure that everything's being done to find their loved one. This was something that Charlotte expressed feeling when it came to dealing with the disappearance of her younger brother. Yeah, I think for me, it's actually got worse over time. I think everyone kind of assumes that you can kind of move on and deal with it and things get better with time. But for me, I think the longer it goes on, I find it harder. You feel like you're going through big stages in your life, for example, getting married and things like that and then he's not there to see that. It upsets me the fact he's never met my husband and when you go through all these big events, you just think how much better it would be if he was here to have enjoyed it with us. It's quite sad. I mean, now we'll soon be thinking about having our own family and things like that, which will be even more upsetting that he won't get to be a part of that. At first, you can kind of... I was able to sort of deal with it, a bit better, but I think over time I've struggled with it internally more because you can't settle on one thing, you know. You can't just move and grieve and and let it go because there's always that chance that he could be found. We just don't know whether he's alive or dead or... You can't let it go. Whether Andrew is alive or dead is a huge contention. Newspaper articles have been published with titles like Missing Youth Andrew Gosden Feared Dead, alongside others like Missing Children, Andrew Just Tell Us You're Alive. A quick internet search turns up dozens of theories about why Andrew left home that Friday and what happened to him after he arrived at King's Cross Station. The most popular theory is that Andrew was distraught or depressed and that he went to London to commit suicide. The family largely dismisses this theory because there were no obvious warning signs that Andrew struggled with any form of mental illness. It also raises the larger question, why would Andrew travel all the way to London to kill himself? Despite their reluctance to accept this theory, In 2011, the Gosdens contracted with a private firm to use sonar technology to scan the bottom of the River Thames. Over time, we, as you might imagine, have tried to explore every possible theory we can come up with as to what might have happened to Andrew. Two of those possible theories have to be uh, suicide or murder. Now, obviously, the body has not come to light above the ground, so it seemed logical to suppose that there could be one in the river. Now, we were really helped by experts who looked in things like the tidal flows and patterns and so on, and because the Thames barrier is there, how that affects things, which led them to the conclusion that a body could be trapped down there, even given the passage of time. 
duly they sonar scanned a, a very long stretch of the Thames. They did, in the course of that scan, find a body, but it was not Andrew's. Do they know whose body it was? Like, were they ever able to identify that one? The police simply said, well, you know, look, let's put it this way. It had concrete shoes. It means it was a murder. So obviously I don't know what the outcome was there at all. But hey, I mean, I guess, you know, it didn't get an answer for us, but perhaps there's another family out there that has got um, some kind of answer. The other theory Kevin suggests is one more sinister. The idea that Andrew could have traveled to London where he met someone who eventually murdered him. This theory is a little bit more difficult to tackle because it neglects to address the reason why Andrew would have gone to London in the first place. One of the theories that is popular in explaining why Andrew left is because he was going to London to meet up with someone he had been talking to on the internet. Despite the popularity of this theory, none of Andrew's family members have reason to believe this is true for multiple reasons. First, Andrew didn't use a computer at home. All of the computers at his school were searched after his disappearance, and none of them contained any relevant information. The only way Andrew could have accessed the internet would have been through one of his gaming systems. But according to his father, he never set up any online accounts with them. We've actually only had a computer in the house for a number of weeks, which was, A, belonged to his sister Charlotte. (laughs) He hadn't even gotten around to making himself an email account. He had fairly limited opportunities there. Not none, but they were fairly limited. And, I mean, you know, obviously computers at home, school and in the local library system where he sometimes went were all examined and, you know, not a trace of anything that could be remotely considered any sort of lead ever came up. So the most then direct link that Andrew would have had to the internet would either have been through his PSP or through his Xbox, is that fair to say? No, because he wasn't because he hadn't got as far as making himself an email address, he couldn't register for, a, for an online account with them. In addition to Andrew's lack of access to the internet, popular social media sites like Facebook were only footnotes back in 2007. Charlotte insists, though, that even if they had been a thing back in 2007, she couldn't imagine Andrew taking part. If he was going somewhere for a purpose, these days you would expect that to be because he'd met someone or talked to someone online, but this was 10 years ago when, literally, I don't think he was even interested in a mobile phone at that point. He just didn't didn't get involved with that. He, I had a laptop, but he didn't use it. He just didn't really seem interested or social in that way. Like, nowadays, everyone's on social media, but that would have been his worst nightmare. <laughs> he just wasn't really interested in anything like that, so... There wasn't really many opportunities he would have had to speak to anyone online. Assuming then that Andrew didn't leave that day to commit suicide or meet up with some online predator, what could he have been doing in London that Friday or that weekend? There were several events in London, one of those events being a YouTuber gathering that Saturday. Armchair sleuths have spent hours sifting through videos on YouTube of this gathering, and despite a few people who look similar, there is no evidence that Andrew attended. It's highly unlikely that Andrew had even seen many YouTube videos, let alone been obsessed with a YouTuber that he would risk traveling all the way to London to meet one of them. Since Andrew took his PSP with him to London, but neglected to bring the charger. Some people have speculated that he could have been going to London to purchase a new PSP. Nine days earlier, on September 5th, the PSP 2000, a slimmer redesign of the model Andrew had, was released in Europe. Could Andrew have been traveling to London to purchase a new PSP? This theory only leads to more questions. 
if he did want to buy a new PSP, why would Andrew travel all the way to London to buy one? There was a shopping mall in Doncaster, and even if there wasn't, Leeds, the UK's fourth largest urban area, is closer than London, only 45 minutes north. The last set of theories about why Andrew went to London that day revolve around concerts or bands that Andrew may have been interested in attending. He liked his rock music. He went a bit more for metal than I would. I'm, I'm kind of in your news, you to Coldplay kind of continuum mainly. Andrew would go more, you know, a bit more heavy uh, with what he liked. The day Andrew left home, he put on a Slipknot t-shirt, both a reflection of who he was and a possible clue that he might have been planning on attending the concert of a similar band. In our research, we found two bands playing in London that night that Andrew might have been interested in seeing. That night, the band 30 Seconds to Mars, a popular American rock band, played to a sold-out show at the Brixton Academy in London. Could the 200 pounds in cash he withdrew from his account been the money Andrew needed in order to buy a scalped ticket off the street? There was another band performing in London that night, a band called Sixth, which is known to play shows with Slipknot. Two members of the band, Mikey Goodman and Justin Hill, were leaving the band for good, and this show, at the Carling Academy, would be their last. If Andrew was a fan of this band, this show would have been a -a once-in-a-lifetime experience for the teenager. But, unfortunately, there is no evidence that he attended either of these shows, or that he even liked these bands. I also saw that 30 Seconds to Mars was playing that day that he left. Was he interested in that band at all? Honestly, I don't know. I don't know. He didn't tell me every band. I know that you had mentioned before about his interest in heavy metal music. Did you go to any concerts or had he gone to any concerts and or was he part of any larger community in connection to heavy metal music specifically? No, I wouldn't have said so. I mean, you'd just crank it on in his room and... If it got too much, we used to go, could you um, just reduce it slightly in volume? <laughs> and be like, oh, all right then. <laughs> no, actually, I think the biggest gig I took him to was oh, actually on my 40th birthday, so he would have been 12 but I took him and Charlotte to see Muse because we all liked the band Muse at uh, Sheffield Arena and had an absolutely brilliant time and got the tour t-shirts and everything, you know, <laughs> as you do. The family trip to see Muse is important when discussing the possibility of Andrew attending a concert because if this is where he wanted to go, it seems likely that he would have at least shared this idea with his parents. According to Kevin, their parenting style was not controlling or limiting, but was accepting. They wanted Andrew to be happy in his life, whatever he chose to do. You know, I mean, we just used to say, look, you know, we really don't care if you're going to get a Nobel Prize in astrophysics or something, or whether you want to work on the till, checking out food in, in Tesco or something. What's important is that you find what makes you happy and you do it. I think probably at his age and stage, he was really, you know, perhaps sort of thinking around, well, what does make me happy? <laughs> you know? Maybe trying to figure out what made him happy is part of why he chose to go to London on his own that day. It's also important to remember that no matter how accepting his parents may have been, it is clear from his actions that he was pushing boundaries and wanted to set out on his own, even if it was only for that day. Maybe this was Andrew's way of wanting to express some independence, and maybe he wanted to do this by going to a concert or some other event on his own. I imagine this to be a long shot. But if you or someone you know were at either of those shows, please check out our website, thinairpodcast.com, to look at pictures of Andrew and see if it triggers any memories. 
Something as simple as a picture could shed some light on his actions before he vanished, as well as whether or not he was with somebody. Despite all the theories that exist out there about what could have happened to Andrew, none of them provide much closure to Kevin or Charlotte. Because like one of the worst case scenarios is that he's been taken and he's somewhere he doesn't want to be. And, you know, the last thing you would want is to give up on, on that and move on. You know, if, he, if he's out there somewhere, we want to find him. And whatever option you think of is bad. I mean, the, there's the option that, I mean, he could have died that day. We, we really don't know. But that's horrible in itself. And then there's the other option that he deliberately has gone somewhere and is not contacting us. And that's painful because you don't want to think that he would, could be that cruel to leave us in limbo. But then there's the option, you know, that he's been taken and is somewhere he doesn't want to be. And that's maybe the worst option of all. Over the past 10 years, there has been little new evidence in the case of Andrew Gosden. The only potential break happened in 2008, when a man visited a police station after hours and used the call box, claiming he had information about the disappearance of Andrew Gosden. When officers responded some time later, the man was gone and has never been heard from despite multiple pleas for him to come forward. My next question was about the, an incident in November of 2008 about someone who got on an intercom claiming to know something about Andrew's disappearance. What can you tell me about that? All, all I know about it is that somebody turned up at... You occasionally have just very small offices around places that are not staffed at all times. They're simply used as a local base as and when need arises. Um, and they tend to have an intercom outside that will then put the person through to somebody in, in another building. So apparently they did this and said that they had some information. But, I mean, I lost track, but it wasn't... I think the guy then if it was a man or a woman, whoever it was, then realising they couldn't speak to somebody directly moved on and they weren't able to find who it was to go back and ask. Even though there haven't been any big breaks in the case since Andrew disappeared, the case remains open and active, especially with the renewed push by Missing People UK and the 10-year anniversary marker. It remains open, but with no leads whatsoever to go on. Um, it really, the, the only thing, it just relies on either somebody has known something all along and for some reason they come forward, or somebody knew something at the time that they'd forgotten and then remember and they come forward or that Andrew himself is alive and well and makes contact that's really what it relies on now I believe they the police officers run an annual check on things like uh, hospital John Doe's passport national insurance numbers, that sort of thing, just to check that nothing's flagged up. You know, there, there just isn't... Because we've got no idea why he went, whether he even stayed in London for more than a matter of hours, it's, you know, where do you start looking? What do you think that people or our listeners can do to help in Andrew's case? I mean, now I tend to, because we have no particular leads whatsoever, the main hope that we've got is that someone will have their memory jogged or might know something that they hadn't realised they knew. <laughs> I mean, if Andrew is still alive, ten years later he will look very, very different. He will sound different. He will have had experiences that make him a very different person. So I would say that the, 
the most helpful thing for us personally as a family is uh, just to share details about him through social media or whatever that sort of thing. In the hope that, you know, maybe one day it hits the right person and we get to find out what happened. While the Missing People organization couldn't talk to us about Andrew's case specifically, they did address some general issues in regards to teenagers who leave home voluntarily. It's very rare that um, anyone goes missing for a long period of time. We think that about 76% will return within 24 hours, and only 2% of people that go missing will remain so for longer than a week, which is obviously a good thing, though it's rare that people are missing for months or years. That doesn't take away from the huge trauma of someone having to live with that, because it does happen. But we try to take every missing episode as seriously as another, because to start with, you don't know how long it's going to go on for. But also, even if someone's only missing for a few days, that might still be a sign that something quite serious is going on in their life. Something that we struggled with was whether or not Andrew would be considered a runaway. The legal definition of a runaway varies, but is generally when a minor voluntarily leaves their parent or legal guardian without permission. Andrew, even if it's not known if he meant to go missing for a long period of time, is considered a runaway, according to this definition. Of course, we do not know if he intended to return home or not, which is where things get tricky. Josie explains that those who are considered runaways span a wide range of scenarios. I don't think you could ever say there is a specific cause, and it's really on a sort of continuum of, at one side, there might be children, young people who are reported missing after a very short period who might be pushing boundaries, sort of wanting to do something that is normal teenage behaviour, so wanting to stay out a little bit later. I don't think that should be ignored because, again, there might be something below the surface going on, but it may well just be normal and absolutely fine. And then it goes right through to the young people that are escaping abuse or uh, being coerced or exploited or even, and this is incredibly rare, but have been abducted or kidnapped. Josie went on to explain that all runaways are in danger and have few places to turn. One piece of research suggested that about 18,000 children a year run away overnight and either sleep rough or stay on the streets or stay with a stranger that they've only just met. So that's obviously a huge number and it's incredibly worrying because being homeless, sleeping on the streets is always risky for anyone of any age. And if you have the vulnerability of being a child, it's hugely dangerous. So we would never want children staying out overnight. And similarly, staying with a stranger has all of the risks that you'd expect associated with it. In terms of help, um, local authorities, so social workers and police, uh, are often brilliant at ensuring that children and young people are prevented from ending up in that situation. But sadly, children and young people don't always ask for help, so it's often not known that that's where they're staying. And there are no longer any dedicated refuges for under 18 year olds in this country. So if a child or young person runs away, there's nowhere safe for them to stay other than returning home or being taken into child services care, which isn't always what those people want. So that can be quite difficult to persuade them to go somewhere safe because there aren't brilliant options out there. Missing People hopes to prevent and help those thinking about leaving home for any reason by providing a helpline available 24-7. What it really comes down to at three in the morning when a child rings us saying they don't feel safe and they don't know where to go is that we don't have many options to refer them to. And often we just have to try and keep them safe for a few hours by staying on the phone to them, making sure they're in public places, ensuring that uh, they're never alone. And then in the morning, we're able to put them in contact with relevant services. But that's not really good enough. We need more options to ensure that those children have somewhere safe to go overnight. One of the things I guess that I'd really like to get out there, and this applies to the, actually the whole of Europe 
and it will continue to apply in the UK even after Brexit, is that the helpline for missing kids, for the families of missing kids, anybody concerned about a missing kid is a really easy free phone 24-7 number, which is 116 000. If you're a teenager, put that number in your phone. If you're a parent, make sure your kid puts that, that number in their phone. It's absolutely free. If you ever need to call it, or if you've got a friend who needs to call it, nobody's going to judge you for the issues you're facing or the way that you're feeling or anything. They are just there to try and help and support you. I, if I want to say anything, it's we've had 10 years of absolute hell. And it really made life an unimaginable struggle. And, you know, use that number before you go walking out the door and just devastating not just your own family, but your friends, the community that you live in. It, you know, it has a really big impact. Andrew Gosden was 14 years old when he left home on September 14th, 2007. Today, Andrew would be 24. At the time he went missing, Andrew had longish brown hair, brown eyes, and wore strong prescription glasses. He was last seen wearing a black Slipknot t-shirt, jeans, and a watch on his left hand. Because of the length of time Andrew has been missing, his parents have released an aged progress photograph of Andrew with what he might look like in his 20s. While some physical descriptions might change, it is important to note that Andrew had a uniquely shaped right ear called a double ridge. For images of his ear, visit our website, thinairpodcast.com. If you believe you have seen Andrew, please contact the South Yorkshire Police Department or the NPIA Missing Persons Bureau. You can also visit Kevin's website, helpustofindandrew.weebly.com, where you can message him directly, or you are always welcome to email us at thinairpodcast at gmail.com, and we'll pass the tip along for you. Lastly, I leave you with a letter written to Andrew from his family, which is posted on their website. It reads, Dear Andrew, We have all missed you so much since the day you left. Not a day goes by that you are not in our minds constantly. You are always so witty, polite, caring, and intelligent that we desperately miss your company. The same is true of all your friends and the thousands of people who have prayed for you and helped us search for you. If you should ever read this, forget about any water under the bridge and please have no fear about making contact with us. We do not care where you have been or what lifestyle you choose for yourself. We only want to know that you are safe and well and to help and support you if we can. We remain as proud of you as we have always been and love you deeply. All our love, Dad, Mom, and Charlie. Thin Air Podcast is produced by myself, Daniel Calderon, and Jordan Sims. Music today was provided by Blue Dot Sessions. Check them out at sessions.blue. Additional music provided by Poddington Bear and Chris Zabriskie. Check out his music at chriszabriskie.com. Thin Air Podcast is supported by our donors at patreon.com slash thinairpodcast. Certain patrons donate a set monthly amount to be credited as executive producers of our show. The executive producers are Jack and Christy Lupian, Drusella Dents, Rebecca Hardberger, Aaron Moore, Lark McManus, Heather Cadieu, Corbin Mooner, Bonnie Mortensen, Anthony Loper, 
Elizabeth Farmer, and Mistea Pena. Thank you so much for your incredible support of our podcast.